Hello English 351, 651, Wordsworth and his circle. In this brief lecture, I would like to talk about Hazlitt's essay, My First Acquaintance with Poets, first published in 1823 in a magazine called The Liberal. This essay exhibits several qualities that Hazlitt will show throughout his essay writing. Um, this essay, like Hazlitt's other essays, is an example of the familiar essay. Uh, this is a kind of essay, Lamb writes it as well, that feels like conversation. It's relaxed, uh, it's intimate, sometimes confessional, uh, it's, it's casual, it's not ornate um, in diction, um, or it's not overly mannered in its tropes and figures. And usually the familiar essay um, is a direct, vivid, exploration of a phenomenon that is fairly common to all of us. Well, one part of this essay that I want to note is that it is driven by an antithesis. Uh, Hazlitt, trained as a philosopher, uh, is very keen on distinctions, on antitheses. Uh, we see this in particular in On Going a Journey, uh, where he talks about uh, the difference between traveling with someone and traveling without someone. Uh, we see it on in On the Pleasure of Hating, uh, where we learn the difference between loving someone um, and hating someone and how they're ultimately dependent upon one another. Well, the primary antithesis in my first acquaintance with poets is innocence and experience. Uh, throughout the essay, we see Hazlitt looking back on this time in 1798 when he first met Coleridge and Wordsworth a uh, time when he felt a lot of hope and possibility, and even if he wasn't as intellectually advanced, he was happier um, than the Hazlitt who is now writing in the 1820s, uh, who is a man who is filled with loss and regret and bitterness, even though he can think more fluently. Um, so that shows up on several of the pages. Um, secondly, a, a major part of this essay um, would be the vivid descriptions. Um, in this essay, not so much vivid descriptions of the natural world, more vivid descriptions of the people, um, primarily Coleridge and Wordsworth. We've seen this description of Coleridge, but it's worth looking at again to get a sense of how striking Hazlitt can be. Hazlitt trained as a painter, uh, how striking he can be in rendering human character in just a few quick strokes. Coleridge's complexion um, at that time was clear, even bright. His forehead was broad and high, light as if built of ivory, with large projecting eyebrows, and his eyes rolling beneath them like a sea with darkened luster. A certain tender bloom his face o'erspread, a purple tinge as we see it in the pale thoughtful complexions of the Spanish portrait painters. His mouth was gross, voluptuous, open, eloquent, his chin good-humored and round, but his nose, the rudder of the face, the index of the will, was small, feeble, nothing, like what he has done. And that final little bit is classic Hazlitt, uh, in the midst of describing the grandiosity of Coleridge, uh, now noting that Coleridge too uh, is no longer as grand as he was. He too has lost um, his powers of expression um, as he has aged. So in addition to the antithesis, in addition to the um, vivid descriptions, another key part of the essay is the digression. Um, from time to time, Hazlitt, in the midst of describing the scene in January or um, in the springtime of 1798 uh, will suddenly digress um, into his present moment. And a key moment, um, a key example of that occurs very early in the essay. When he says, um, in talking about meeting Coleridge, I was at that time dumb, inarticulate, helpless, like a worm by the wayside, crushed, bleeding, lifeless. But now, bursting from the deadly bands that bound them, my ideas float on winged words, and as they expand their plumes, catch the golden light 
of other years. My soul has indeed remained in its original bondage, dark, obscure, with longings infinite and unsatisfied. My heart, shut up in the prison house of this rude clay, has never found, nor will it ever find, a heart to speak to. But that my understanding also did not remain dumb and brutish, or at length found a language to express itself, I owe to Coleridge. But this is not to my purpose. So already within, within the very first paragraph of an essay on his acquaintance with the poets, he digresses fairly far afield to talk about his own experience right now in the present, again, over 10 years later um, down the road. And then suddenly he pulls back and says, no, 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 that's not my purpose here. But this is a quality of the familiar essay, just as relaxed conversation is often characterized by digression, um, so the familiar essay. So, antithesis, vivid description, digression, candor. Uh, no writer we've seen thus far in this class is as forthcoming as Hazlitt about his weaknesses, his failures, his blind spots. Uh, he's so raw, it, feel, it feels disarming sometimes. You almost want to say, hey, Hazlitt, you don't have to tell us everything. And we see this candor come through very clearly. Um, in this essay over on this particular page um, where um, Hazlitt is describing his journey from Wim to Nether Stowey. Remember Coleridge invites the young Hazlitt to come spend time with him um, in Nether Stowey. And he says, um, I was still two days before the time fixed for my, for my arrival um, for I'd taken care to set out early enough. I stopped these two days at Bridgewater, and when I was tired of sauntering on the banks of its muddy river, returned to the inn and read a novel. So have I loitered my life away, reading books, looking at pictures, going to plays, hearing, thinking, writing on what pleased me best. I have wanted only one thing to make me happy, but wanting that, have wanted everything. Well, here, Hazlitt's readers, well, some of them might have known that he was referring to Sarah Walker, uh, the young woman um, with whom he fell, fell madly in love in, in 1820, and his inability to uh, win her love back wrecked his life. And so here he is in the midst of this you know, praise of youth and genius and Coleridge and Wordsworth very honestly saying that I've, based, I've wasted my life. <laughs> I've wasted my life. I've wasted my life. 